Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Taking calls on whether Christianity works, whether prayer works. We've received, uh, so give us a call, 888 We'll We'll take calls for the rest of this segment on that particular topic. Does prayer work? Has prayer uh, worked for you? And glad to have you call in and, and give us your own personal observations. Remember, we've got secular hospitals, secular universities confirming that prayer works, Christianity works like to hear it from you as well. Uh, Debbie sent me a text that she received from a friend who was listening to the program while driving and therefore wasn't able to call in. And she raises the question, does prayer work? And she answers her own question, absolutely. With a son in prison for life, without prayer and the Holy Spirit in my life, how could I, as his mother, begin to survive? Yes, prayer works, and I am here to proclaim it. So you know one of the you know, one of the tremendous benefits of being in a relationship with God is having some place to go to when times are tough, when there's tremendous pressure and stress. We've got some place to go. We've got some place to look. We've got someone to depend on for help and for strength. You know, and it may be just for the strength to get to the end of this day. I've got people I pray for right now that are under tremendous uh, circumstances of just agony and heartache. And a lot of times my prayer for them, I'm praying for them all the time, and a lot of times the prayer is, Lord, just give them the strength to get to the end of this day. You know, you've said, Lord, that uh, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for each day has enough trouble of its own. And, you know, the people I love and care for, I can certainly bear witness to the truth of that statement of Christ. And so I just pray that God will just help them make it to the end of the day. Sometimes it's a matter of just putting one foot in front of the other, and then when you've done that, you take the next step. And you don't look too far down the trail. You just try to take the next step that you know God wants you to take. And and one of the benefits of being in a relationship with God is you have some source there to sort of help you take that next step and to make it to the end of the day. 888-589-8840 if you'd like to call in about how Christianity and prayer has worked for you. I just want to read some excerpts before we go back to the phones, 888 from a, a column by Thomas Sowell. And this has to do with, um, with race and IQ in part. Now, uh, there have been a lot of articles written and research done about IQ differentials among races. And there seem to be, over time, some difference in intelligence quotient, intelligence uh, capacity, that is race-related. In other words, these results are from IQ tests have been pretty consistent over time. Asians have the highest IQs, whites are next, then it goes on from there. But there seem to be some race-based differences in IQ. And then people scream racism. When you try to bring that up, they scream racism. That's Well, no, it's not. It's just science. These are just objective IQ tests. I mean, nobody is, there's no racism or bigotry involved. These are just standardized tests. Everybody takes the same test, and we tabulate the results. Nothing racist about that process. But what, it, but what it illustrates to me is kind of an alarming feature of our culture, and, and that is that would only be a problem. If it, let's, say, let's assume for the sake of argument that there are IQ differences between various races. Just for the sake of argument, let's assume that. The only reason that that would be, that people would be outraged over that or made angry by that, or lob accusations of racism, is if they believed that having a higher IQ made you a better person. It made you a superior person. And the reality is if we believe that, if we believe that having a higher IQ makes you a superior person, makes you a superior race of being, uh, then we'll never be able to have an honest, objective conversation about IQ, but I don't believe that, and the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that being smart makes you a better person than somebody else. In fact, you've got a lot of statements in the Scripture where um, people who are highly intelligent and highly educated um, are, are the greatest fools and the most evil people in a culture. You know, and C.S. Lewis made this observation. I read that quote from him on the anniversary of his death uh, late in November, that if someone gets an education and that education is not grounded in the morality of God, 
then what you get out of that process is, is a highly educated devil. In other words, that person now, maybe they have more in intellectual capacity, but if it is misused, then they are not a better person. They become a worse person and capable, therefore, of actually more evil. So we got to get past the point where we think that being smart makes you a, uh, a superior person. It doesn't. It's just a gift that God has given you. And, it's, and it, it, you know, other people may have more athletic ability. They may have more administrative ability. Uh, they may have more uh, relational ability. I mean, God gives people different gifts, uh, th and he just distributes them a as he chooses. doesn't make anybody a morally superior person. The question is how they use those gifts. But anyway, uh, Thomas Sowell talks about this. I got a little bit out in the weeds here, but here's what he says. Depressing news about black students scoring far below white students on various mental tests has become so familiar that people in different parts of the ideological spectrum have long ago developed different explanations for why this is so. Some of it has to do with these IQ tests. But both may have to do some rethinking in light of radically different views from England. Some people say, well, it's, it's kind of racial differences in IQ. Other people say, no, it's just all poverty. That's the reason. The November 9th through 15th issue of the distinguished British magazine, The Economist, reports that among children who are eligible for free meals in England schools, listen to this, black children of immigrants from Africa meet the standards of school tests nearly 60% of the time, as do immigrant children from Bangladesh and Pakistan. At the bottom among those children who are all from families with low enough incomes to receive free meals at school are white English children who meet the standards 30% of the time. And The Economist points out that there's one borough in London where white students scored lower than black students in any borough in London. These data might seem to be some kind of a fluke, but they confirm the observations in a book titled Life at the Bottom – by British physician Theodore Dalrymple. He said among the patients he treated in a hospital near a low-income housing project, he could not recall any white 16-year-old who could multiply 9 by 7. Some could not even do 3 times 7. 16 years old can't do 9 by 7, can't even do 3 times 7, a lot of them. What jolts us is not only that this phenomenon is so different from what we are used to seeing in the United States, but that also that it fits neither the genetic, that's the uh, built-in IQ differential between the races, nor the environmental, poverty is the reason, explanation of black-white educational differences here. These white students in England come from the same race that produced Shakespeare and the great scientist Sir Isaac Newton, among other world-class intellects over the centuries. But today, many young whites in England are barely literate and have trouble with simple arithmetic, nor are these white students the victims of racial discrimination, much less the descendants of slaves. So he goes on later. What do low-income whites in England and ghetto blacks in the United States have in common? It cannot be simply low incomes because children from other groups in the same low-income brackets outperform whites in England and outperform blacks in America. What low-income whites in England and ghetto blacks in the United States have in common is a generations-long indoctrination in victimhood. Listen to this. This is, what, see, uh, this is what Thomas Sowell, who I think is the smartest man in the world, he says this is the explanation for poor academic performance, a generations-long indoctrination in victimhood. The political left in both countries has, for more than half a century, maintained a steady and loud drumbeat of claims that the deck is stacked against those at the bottom. The American left uses race and the British left uses class, but the British left has been at it longer. In both countries, immigrants who have not been in the country as long have not been so distracted by such ideology into a blind resentment and lashing out at other people. Those who promote an ideology of victimhood may imagine that they are helping those at the bottom when, in fact, they are harming them more so than the society that the left is denouncing. In other words, they trap them in this kind of vicious cycle. It's always somebody else's fault. If I don't succeed, if I don't advance, it's because I'm a victim. It's because somebody's out to get me. They've got more power than I do. We in America have gotten used to vast gaps between blacks and whites on test scores, but this was not always 
the case in places where there was anything like comparable education. Back in the 1940s, before the vast expansion of the welfare state and the ideology of victimhood used to justify it, there was no such gap on test scores between black schools in Harlem and white working class schools on New York's lower east side. So just kind of a fascinating theory that uh, Thomas Sowell says, look, the, the reason that lower class whites in England don't perform well on tests is they've been told all their life they're victims. They're, they're, they're victims of those with power. They're victims of the evil capitalists. In America, blacks are taught that they are victims of white oppressors in colonial America. And Thomas Sowell's point is it doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you were indoctrinated and brainwashed to believe all of your life that you have been a victim, that things are hopeless, that you are helpless, there's nothing you can do about it, people with more power than you have you down, there isn't anything, all you're going to develop is the spirit of resentment and this spirit of entitlement. I'm entitled to things that I don't have, and therefore I'm just going to go get them. Or this spirit of resentment, it just kind of breeds this tension between people. Uh, rather than people taking advantage of the opportunities that are given to them, you know, and Thomas Sowell points out, look, you go back to Harlem in the 1940s, blacks in Harlem were doing just as well as working class whites on the other uh, side of New York when the education was comparable and nobody was carrying around uh, this victimhood instilled in them by the grievance gurus. Uh, focal point, AF for talk. Uh, hang on, those of you that have called in, I'll get you right out of the break, right after the news. Stay with us. You are listening to Focal Point on AFR Talk. Be back after the news.